Okay. Uh, well, uh, first of all, just uh, a welcome to all the new passengers who, who joined us. I'm very glad to see uh, a number of you in here and uh, hopefully some of you watching in your, uh, in your cabins. Uh, just maybe take a moment. I'll be talking a little more tonight in our welcome, but my name is Ron Orenstein and I'm uh, here as your naturalist lecturer on this cruise. I also run the wildlife watches from 8 to 10 up in, 10 in the Explorer's Lounge on Deck 7. Um, you see, see things. This, this morning our high point was a school of about six different species of tern and it turned out after I looked at my photographs that they were feeding above a big school of skipjack tuna which were jumping out of the water. I didn't even notice them until after I looked at the photographs. But So you never know what you're going to get as Forrest Gump said, so uh, please come join me. Anyway, uh, today's lecture is I think apropos. We're paralleling the Great Barrier Reef, the greatest reef system in the world, so we're going to talk about coral reefs and how they operate and how they develop, what lives there and what problems they're facing in the world today, which is unfortunately they're facing a good many. So this is a map showing the distribution of coral reefs in the world and though there are very many of them all around the world, they really only occupy less than two, uh, two tenths of one percent of the planet is, is actually occupied by these enormously rich ecosystems, the richest ecosystems in the sea and paralleled only by rainforests on the land. You can see we're now in the Australian section of the reefs and we'll be moving up into the Southeast Asian reefs once we, we leave Darwin. Uh, and as a matter of fact, even though there's such a tiny part of the world's surface, they involve a great many countries. There's more than a hundred countries in the world that have coral reefs uh, within their, their boundaries, that live on reef coastlines. And of course, as I said, they're extraordinarily rich in life. Uh, it's been estimated that nine million species of living things, and that includes animals, it includes plants, it includes algae, live on the coral reefs of the world. This of course being a picture of the Great Barrier Reef in its prime. A, a fine example, of course. Uh, and they've been around for quite some time. The reefs in the uh, Coral Triangle area, which we're going to be sailing through north of Australia, have probably been around for about 34 million years, which is actually a pretty long time because coral reefs themselves are a fairly new phenomenon. As, as I'll mention later, uh, reefs were been have been around for hundreds of millions of years, but they weren't always made of coral, which is interesting, I think. But today, the prime component of reefs are the coral pulps, these guys. And uh, they're, they look rather insignificant compared to what they produce, of course, but they are, they're very, very important animals indeed. Uh, they reefs begin to form when the larvae of these little tiny coral polyps land on a suitable substrate, someplace where they can attach, build their skeletons, and start to form the reef. And that requires a good many conditions to be just right. You need to have the right temperature. You need to have the right level of salinity, salt levels, because that does vary in the sea. And particularly the pH, the acidity level, needs to be just right in order for them to build their skeletons. And that combination of features doesn't really occur very often. They're relatively rare. That's why reefs are occupying such a small part of our planet. So the, there are several types of coral. Not all of them are main reef builders. The main ones are these. This is uh, off Cairns. These are the stony corals or hard corals or scleractinia if you want the fancy name. And they are the ones who are able to build skeletons around themselves made of calcium carbonate, actually out of a mineral called aragonite, which is the hardest and densest form of calcium carbonate as opposed to say calcite, which is uh, a weaker substance. So they can build very strong and long lasting skeletons of calcium carbonate. And that's how you get this. Now there are also soft corals. They're not really reef builders. They maybe more think of them as reef decorators. They produce all these lovely sea fans and sea whips and soft corals. They don't 
build those skeletons of calcium carbonate that the hard corals do. They produce instead, their tissues are full of little tiny spikes called sclerites that gives their, their form some structure and uh, you know, s uh, stability, but they're not reef builders like the other corals. There are even corals like this one that don't produce any skeleton at all. They just sort of sit there and they'll do very much while they're catching things. This particular one is called orange cup coral. It's a Pacific coral. It's unfortunately gotten loose in the Caribbean and the Atlantic and it's become an invasive pest there. I'm not sure how that happened. Perhaps escapes from Aquaria, but it is native to the Pacific. But this produces no skeleton at all. So again, it's, its role from, say, an aesthetic perspective is purely decorative. Now, how does a coral polyp work? Here's a, here's a picture of the anatomy of a polyp. Now, if you know what a sea anemone is, or you think of a, maybe a jellyfish upside down because they're related, they're all in that same group of animals, uh, a coral polyp basically consists of a little column of tissue with tentacles, and those tentacles are lined with stinging cells, they're called nematocysts. Now, in most sea anemones and, these, and in jellyfish, these stinging cells capture the prey that are then taken down into the mouth and down into the digestive chamber in the center of the animal and that's how it gets its food. Coral polyps aren't like that though. They have the tentacles, they have the stinging cells. Some of them can give you a fairly nasty burn, although most of them are not that strong, but that's not how, what they depend on. What they depend on, you see in that lower picture, all those little green dots in that transparent polyp, you can see them marked up there, are actually little algae. They're called, the fancy word is zoosanthellae. They are little clumps, individual algal cells, and they live inside the polyp. And they can photosynthesize. They can produce food like a plant can. And that food is what keeps the polyp going. So in, as a matter of fact, they also help it recycle oxygen. They help it remove waste. Because of course, the, one of the byproducts of photosynthesis is oxygen. So they provide that to the polyp. So they think 90% of the food that is being produced produced by these zooxanthellae, these algae, is passed on to the polyp. So they're vital for keeping that polyp alive. They're also responsible, by the way, from a visual point of view, for giving the polyp, the corals, their color. The, the color you see on living corals is the color of these algae, not the color of the polyps themselves. And that becomes a rather important, we'll talk about this later, when we talk about coral bleaching, which is a major problem today. So that's how a polyp acts and lives. Uh, now not all reef builders on a reef are coral polyps. Most of them are today. But as a matter of fact, if you had gone back to the time of the dinosaurs, say 80 or 90 million years ago, you would have had reefs, but there wouldn't have been any corals. What you would have had instead were reefs that were built by, of all things, a kind of clam. Uh, a clam called a rudist clam. If you can imagine a clam shell with it's two valves like that, but in a rudist clam, the lower valve, the one down here, actually built up into a great big stony pillar, and then these pillars all clumped together, and that made the reefs. That was, that was what would have been the equivalent of a reef in the time of the dinosaurs. Coral polyps are kind of late covers, sort of Johnny come lately to the reef building business. But today, we also have re uh, corals, coral, not corals, we have structures on the reef that are built by algae, directly by a kind of algae, red algae. Usually, they can build up these calcareous skeletons made of calcium carbonate, just like a polyp, and they can be a major component of the reefs. This is a, an example here of a, a coralline alga. Now, in fact, barrier reefs and reefs that are exposed to a lot of pounding waves will often have a cap on the top of the reef that is actually built by these algae. And that's very important for the reef because the, the skeletons that are built up by the algae are actually harder and denser than the skeletons built up by the coral polyps. And the result is that when waves beat against the reef, they take and take it, whereas the waves are more likely to destroy the skeletons of stony corals. So they live in these exposed areas up into the wave line at the surface where most corals can't grow properly, so they protect the reef structure. So they're very important. And in fact, they've been actually building reefs longer than coral polyps have. Instead of, say, 30, 40 million years, they've been doing it for about 145 million years. And in, if you go to the Atlantic, like around Bermuda, for argument's sake, uh, there are reefs that are primarily built of coral 
coralline algae and not coral polyps. So that gives you an idea of how re what puts a reef together, puts the skeleton, the structure of the reef together. Now, scientists have wondered for a long time, how do these reefs actually form? How do they form, where they are, the types of reef? And once the scientist who was very, very interested in this back in the mid-19th century was Charles Darwin. And Darwin, of course, had traveled around the world on his voyage of the Beagle and had uh, investigated a good many reefs. And he also was puzzled as to how some of these reefs could form, particularly how you could have reefs out in the middle of the ocean. Corals need to be near the surface. They need light because those coral algae, the algae in the corals have to be able to photosynthesize. So how can a reef form in the very, very deep ocean where down at the bottom there's practically no light at all? Well, Darwin thought about this and he proposed a theory that's pretty well stood the test of time until really almost very, very recently, I'll mention this, he recognized three types of reef that he saw as stages in reef formation. And uh, his theory is still the main one that is taught in schools and textbooks today. As I'll mention in a minute, there's been a recent challenge to that, but this is the, probably the idea most people know about. So we start out with a fringing reef, a reef that's growing out from the shore so it can start in shallow water. So they can establish themselves in shallow water, they have lots of light coming in, and the reef can build up and spread out from an island like this one in the Maldives. So fringing reefs can also be broken up. They, sometimes they call them patch reefs. It, that can usually be a place where the reef has been broken up at certain points or where it's just starting to form. It hasn't filled in completely around the island yet. And of course the Maldives is one of the countries in the world that is made entirely of coral reefs. There, there's no other kind of land in the Maldives. And uh, they, they could be, say, early stages or they can be results of breakup. Now the next stage what Darwin saw is that once these islands have had fringing reefs built up around them, they may start to wear away or sink, particularly if they're volcanoes. So you think of the volcano, which is lava is very easily eroded, they would wear away. So the reef would eventually get further and further from shore. It would keep building up. The, the island would be in the center and the reef would be around the outside. That's a barrier reef. And that, this is in Bora Bora, out in the Central Pacific. Barrier reefs are actually about the rarest type of reef to find. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef, of course, is the main one. Uh, it's actually not one reef. It's actually 2,900 individual reefs strung out in a long line over 2,500 kilometers. But we, we talk about it as a single reef so we don't have to remember 2,900 names as we sail along it. Uh, New Caledonia, the reef around New Caledonia, the Pacific is the second largest barrier reef system. It's, it's the largest one that's connected to an island in the world because New Caledonia is a very long, narrow island. And then in, in the Atlantic, the main one is the one off uh, Honduras in the, in the Caribbean. Then Darwin's view is that the next stage is that central island disappears altogether. It sinks beneath the surface and all you've got left is a ring of reef islands uh, around where the uh, old island used to be, and that is an atoll. Now, uh, that's a ring-shaped reef surrounding a central lagoon. Well, maybe kind of irregular ring, but you get the idea. And most atolls, uh, they, they believe, Darwin certainly said, formed on sunken volcanoes. That has just recently been questioned. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, there are these countries here, I mentioned this, the Maldives, but also the Marshall Islands and Tuvalu and Kiribati. Uh, by the way, that rather odd name Kiribati, those used to be called the Gilbert Islands and Kiribati is the way you spell Gilbert in Polynesian. Uh, I'm a Gilbert and Sullivan fan, so I know weird things like that. Uh, atoll actually comes from a Maldivian word, atollhu, which means a, a lagoon island. Now, uh, the new theory, and it's so new I didn't even have a chance to prepare a slide for it, is that atolls may form as a result of, of all things, glaciers. And you think, wait a minute, that, that sounds very weird. But Darwin wasn't aware of the extent of the Ice Age. In his time it wasn't understood fully. What the th new theory suggests is that the reef, these reefs originally formed as platforms, great big platforms that were up almost to the surface of the ocean. And then during the Ice Age, 
glaciers tied up most of the water in the world, or a good deal, not most of it, but a good deal of it, so the sea level fell. And then these tops of these platform reefs were exposed and being made of limestone as the calcium carbonate, uh, they began to dissolve and be broken up by rain and wind and all kinds of other things until finally the only thing that was left was the ring around the outside. That's the new, th and there's been a suggestion that the Maldives and a lot of Pacific atolls may have formed that way and not in the way Darwin suggested suggested that's still a matter for a debate of course. This is a very new idea. So what lives on a reef? Why is it, what sort of things make a reef such a rich place for a biologist or a diver or anyone to explore? Well many things. Of course a huge range of animal life, invertebrates like the sea urchin up here, a feather star which is a a kind of a, a relative of starfishes and sea urchins um, that the, uh, you can find as often as fossils that they're on long stems and they're called sea lilies and there are still living sea lilies in very deep waters but in the uh, reefs they have developed these feather stars that can actually move around by those little group of legs at the bottom. And then of course most often people say the most beautiful animals in the reef are these uh, Christmas tree or feather worms or peacock worms. What you're seeing there are the gills of the worm. The main body of the worm is down, and you can see a bit of it there, but it's down inside the coral and it, it sends these gills out in order to breathe and also possibly trap some microorganisms for food. And then if you, if you go near them and they get upset they just pull them all in out of sight. One of the most important invertebrates on the reef, at least in the Pacific, they don't occur in the Atlantic, are giant clams. Because the clams also have huge shells that are made of, uh, of this calcium carbonate, this aragonite material, much as the old rudest clams were, much as coral is. So they can be enormous. These are the largest mollusks in the world. They can reach up to uh, 136 kilos in, in weight. Uh, the, the mantle colors actually seem to protect the tissues of the clam. They, are, they act as sort of sunshades. They protect it against uh, being exposed too much to sunlight. And like coral polyps, giant clams' tissues are full of algae, of these zooxanthellae, these little cells that make food and provide it to the clam, much as the ones in the coral polyps do to a polyp. And also, th they've carried this one step further. They have little tiny lenses in their tissues, and those lenses focus the sunlight onto the zooxanthellae, the algae, so that they can actually do a better job. They've got more light and produce more food for the clam. That's, that's a wrinkle that the corals haven't come up with, but the giant clams have. Unfortunately today these are very heavily overfished, uh, both for their meat and for the shells which are sold as souvenirs. So uh, it's actually illegal to um, transport. These are now internationally protected. You can't just pick up a giant clam and carry it away with you. Uh, and they're very, very important to the reef. Uh, there are many, this is a different species, but the same general idea of, of giant clam. They provide, of course, food. There's a great big mass of nice uh, seafood there uh, to, for predators and for scavengers once they die. And uh, when they die, all those little algae living inside them are discharged. They, they dumped out into the ocean. They are eaten by other things in on the reef. Also when they reproduce they send out clouds of uh, sperm and egg cells. Those also provide food for other animals on the reef when they're not fertilizing and producing new giant clams. Um, and lots of uh, other sea creatures, small fish and shrimp and things like that, live down inside the tissues, inside the shell of the giant clam, so it gives them a place to live. And all that calcium carbonate, all that mineral material that builds up their shells is recycled back when they die into the limestone that helps build up the coral reef itself. So very, very important for the development of reefs in the Indo-Pacific. An another group, there are many, many kinds of mollusks, uh, clams, sails, etc. on the reef. This is sort of the opposite of the giant clam because sea slugs or nudibranchs, which means naked gill by the way, um, don't have shells at all. Larvae are like the slugs you find in your garden and uh, there are many of them that are very brightly colored. This particular group, the many different species of them, uh, they're bright colored for a reason. They take on toxins from uh, the material that they eat, algae and other things in the sea. They, they can 
carry that out into their body tissues so that these things can be quite toxic. Some of them can deliver a sting. So uh, that's a warning that this is not a very good idea as a lunch choice. Um, other mollusks in the reef include the, the cephalopod squids and octopuses uh, and these cuttlefish which are a kind of squid basically. They're remarkable in their ability to change color, even, even structure to match the reef. They can produce and remove these little protrusions on their bodies to help them uh, camouflage and they can send waves of color moving across their body. It's been speculated, oops, sorry. Hmm, I seem to have lost a... Uh, Ah, sorry, uh, lost a bit of the slide. But basically it's been suggested that these waves of color may actually help this cuttlefish hypnotize the prey, the fish or something they're trying to sneak up on. And so if they stand there saying, what the heck is that before the thing shoots out its tentacles and grabs them for a meal. Not proven, but interesting, I think. So. Fishes, of course, are the things that we tend to think of mostly. We think about diving on a reef. So what do we want to see? Lots and lots of fish. And a lot of studies have been done in, of the community structure, the way fishes live together on the reef. Because, of course, you have a tremendous diversity and tremendous numbers of fish on a coral reef. Um, they often cluster together in groups of many species. They use the corals as hiding places and spawning places, places that they can hide from, from predators. Uh, so uh, what determines how many kinds of fish you can have on a reef and what kinds of fish you have is often the physical structure of the reef itself, the sort of environment that it provides. So uh, what kinds of corals you have may determine what kind of fish you have because each type of coral produces a different shape of skeleton. So larger coral colonies, as you might expect, will support more kinds of fish. That makes a certain amount of sense, I think. But it's also, they've discovered, it's the branching structure of the corals that has a lot to do with what fish live there because the way in which a coral branches and spreads out determines how many little nooks and crannies and things there are for fish to hide in. So uh, a branched coral, for instance, will provide a lot more places for fish to take shelter than, say, a brain coral, which is a big round structure like that and doesn't have any place you can sort of dive into. And they've also found, as a matter of fact, that corals with medium branch lengths actually support more kinds of fish than ones with long or short branch lengths. Exactly why, I'm not precisely sure, but that's a finding that they've made. So there's a tremendous, tremendous variety of fish on the reef, and not just a numbers of species, but the variety of shapes and sizes and colors of fishes on the reef far exceed what you'll find out in the open ocean or in other habitats. It's mostly on a reef that you're going to find strange fishes with things like this long nose butterfly fish at the bottom with this big long, long snout so it can reach down into a crevice in the coral and pick out little bits of food for it to eat. Or the shrimp fish over on the left hand side which looks like that because it hides among the spines of long-spined sea urchins and that stripe going up the body looks like the spine of the urchin. They'll even sway back and forth as the waves rock the urchin back and forth so that's a form of camouflage. You also have very brightly colored fishes like the mandarin fish which may be warning uh, other uh, predators of toxins, things like that. And you have the, uh, the trigger fish up here. Now uh, this trigger fish is kind of interesting. Uh, for those of you who've been to Hawaii, this is a very widespread um, Indo-Pacific trigger fish. It found very widely through the Pacific. But the Hawaiians have given it one of these great long Hawaiian names and that is fabled in song actually. I don't know how many of you ever remember there was an old Hawaiian song about I want to go back to my little grass shack in Kilianokalu, Hawaii where the Humuhumunukunukuapua'a goes swimming by. Well that is a Humuhumunukunukuapua'a. So if you see it swimming by that's the one. You know, you know and, and does anybody here actually know that song? No? You know, I want to go back to my little grass shack. What is it going to kill you in Okulu, Hawaii? Where the huma huma nuku nuku apua goes swimming by? You know, something like that. <laughs> now, coral uh, reef fishes often swarm in schools. Well, many fishes do. Well, why? swarm in a school. Well, a school can be very advantageous for a number of reasons. One may be just simply hydrodynamic, that it's been suggested that the 
current, little currents and eddies created by each fish to sort of make it easier for other fish to kind of sort of bow ride along with them with minimal energy expenditure. Uh, also, there's a lot more eyes to watch out for predators. So anyone sees a predator, they can all make a move. Da you've seen how schools of fishes will turn and dash off together uh, quickly to avoid a predator. And also, they can just simply confuse a predator. You get a mass of fishes like this, and the predator may not know exactly where to dive into the school. It gives the fishes a better chance to get away. And you can see that uh, here's a fish that really, really shows you how, how far you can go in being confusing. I've got this mixture of stripes and spots. Uh, so th that combination, when it's all massed together in a school, may make it, it's almost like a moiré pattern. It may make it very hard for a predator to f pick focus on an individual fish and dive in and grab it. Now, uh, some fishes actually eat coral, oh, particularly these fish, parrot fish, which have that very, very hard beak, and they actually nibble away at coral skeletons. They don't seem to be going for the coral polyps. It seems they're going for algae and blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, living within the coral. And they've developed this complicated structure for eating coral, uh, so here, in the Pacific particularly, not so much in the Atlantic, large parrot fishes will grind up bits of coral, both living coral and dead coral. Because remember, they're not after the polyps. They're after algae living in there, and they may still be there even if the coral is dead. And uh, so as I say, that they're, they're looking for bacteria, other things living within that coral rock. And uh, when they remove the algae, they're actually doing the reef some good. They promote coral growth. They recycle coral skeletons. But they've developed this mechanism to do it. You see, if you look at the left, you can see they have a beak which bites off the bits, but they don't really chew it up. And then if you follow it back through the mouth, you come to what looks like something out of an alien movie. You have the second set of jaws and teeth way back in the back of the throat, and they're the ones that will actually break up uh, even further and chew up the bits of coral before they swallow it. It looks rather fearsome when you see it in cross-section. This is also, by the way, one reason why you should be a little careful eating parrotfish, because some of the algae and bacteria they pick up can uh, produce toxins that end up in the fish and cause a, a very nasty disease called ciguatera which I, I tell you, my, my mother had a case of it once. I was a child living in Jamaica, and uh, she was sick for about six months. It's not nice. Uh, also, the fact that you have so many species on a reef means that some species are able to take advantage of other species. So you have things like this emperor shrimp on the left, which uh, lives in among sponges and uh, sea anemones and other things and just basically finds it a very good place to hide and live and doesn't seem to be doing any good for the sponge. In fact, may even eat bits of a sponge. And then there's this candy crab on the right, I'm oh, sorry, let me go back, carries it even further because it will take bits of algae and things it finds and plant them on its shell, thereby increasing its camouflage when it's among these things. But in some cases, what you have are not sort of passengers hitching a ride, but actual partnerships, somewhat like what you get between the coral polyp and the algae living in its tissues. Each one benefits the other. Now, one of the main ways you do this is cleaner fish and shrimp. Uh, fish can pick up all kinds of parasites, particularly out on the outside of their bodies, fish slice, things like that. And there are fishes like the cleaner wrasse and shrimps like these banded uh, cleaner shrimp that live on these parasites and they will actually set up cleaning stations and fish will actually line up like you're lining up at a petrol pump for their turn to be cleaned and even something like this moray eel is allowing the cleaner wrasse to go down inside its mouth and pick off any parasites that are there. So the fish, are pre well, they, I guess, instinctively otherwise appreciate that this is very good for them. It's been shown that if the cleaners are gone, the fish do not do well. The other fish, they develop diseases. There's a lot more mortality. These things are actually very, very important. Unfortunately for the fish, there's a little uh, blenny that looks very much like the cleaner wrasse. And when a fish approaches it to be cleaned, it doesn't clean them. It takes a bite. <laughs> but that's, I guess, life on the reef. Now, one of the most famous examples of partnership is with the clown fishes. This is, this is for all of you who taken your kids through finding to Finding Nemo or your grandchildren, I imagine a lot of you have, will recognize a clownfish. Um, I, I hate to tell you this, but clownfish 
fathers do not take care of their young. Um, anyway, clownfish live in sea anemones. Now sea anemone tentacles are studded with those stinging cells we talked about earlier. And uh, the, but the clownfish live in the sea anemone. They very rarely will leave it. They'll stay in the sea anemone all the time. They're covered with a mucus, a slime, and that protects them from the stinging cells of the anemone. And uh, they chase away anything that comes near them because they build up a territory and that would include any predators that want to come to the anemone and also by swimming around the anemone they stir up and mix the water so new oxygenated water comes down to the anemone and it can uh, bring in oxygen more easily. So it actually performs a service for the anemone. It's not just that the anemone gives the clownfish a place to hide. Now, uh, one of the difficulties a coral has is reproducing because uh, like, in a way, like a plant, um, if you're going to mate, you have to find a partner and if you can't move, that gets tricky. So uh, coral polyps uh, spawn every once in a while. They can just spread. They can branch off from each other and reproduce asexually. But every once in a while, they will spawn and so will things like these sea cucumbers by simply dumping clouds and clouds of gametes, sperm or eggs, into the ocean like that. There's coral, there's a sea anemone spawning and uh, that these mixed together will mate, form new larvae which will then go off and eventually at least a few of them will survive long enough to start a new, uh, become new adults, start a new reef or a new bunch of sink cucumbers or whatever, ha whatever you want. Um, so we go from sex to sex change. Um, those of you who find this uh, a little uh, upsetting may wish to close your eyes at this point. Um, Fishes aren't like us. You remember, we are male or female by virtue of whether we have an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. In fishes, it depends on what genes you have, and it's, it's a much more fluid uh, situation. So a lot of wrasses, like this specific bird wrasse, they start out as females. They're all, all, they're all born, they're all hatched from their eggs as females, and uh, they will form a, a dominance like a pecking order, a dominance hierarchy of a bunch of them living around a reef and there'll be a top one and various other ones and then that top one turns into a male and he takes over all the other females as his harem and uh, that, that continues on and so he'll defend that, that's his spawning area and uh, if anything happens to him, the next female in the pecking order turns into a male and takes over and keeps the system going. Uh, there, there are quite a few uh, wrasses, particularly members of the wrasse family, that, that do this. But there are also some males that don't seem to, that seem to be able to become male without acquiring all that bright colors and different uh, shape that the, the, uh, the, what they call it, super male is the term they use, the super male has. And they seem to be able to sneak up next to the females and think it's another female and sneak a quick mating before the top male notices them. Uh, which is actually not an uncommon thing in the animal kingdom, but it, particularly in this, it's interesting it happens in, in, in this case. Now, when uh, reef fishes hatch, they often don't look anything like what they're going to look like when they grow up, and they don't necessarily grow up at the same place that they are, that the adults live. Coral reefs are full of predators so that a fish that wants to spawn may want to go somewhere else to spawn where a little safer, there aren't as many predators and a lot of them will simply cast their eggs out into the, into the open sea, into the upper layers, the plankton of the sea. So this thing you would find floating on the surface of the sea is actually the a larval form of this fish, the lionfish. And you can see the huge difference, the change as it grows up and there are many, many fish fishes that, that are like that. Now the open sea is, is an important nursery for many fish but even more important are mangrove swamps and seagrass beds and this is one of the reasons that conservationists talk so much about the importance of preserving mangroves and preserving seagrass because this is important. Without them there aren't nurseries for the coral reef fishes to grow up and then later move out to the reef. Um, they're very, very important uh, for, the, for the health and continued uh, 
growth of the reef. Uh, it depends where you are, which is more important. Mangroves seem to be more important in the Caribbean. Um, seagrass breads, beds are important for feeding grounds for young fish, but they're not as much of a nurseries. In the Pacific, seagrass beds are a lot more important than mangroves, and largely because a lot of the mangroves are simply exposed at high tide, so fish can't stay among the mangroves. They have to swim out when the tide goes down, and that's not true of seagrass beds. Now, reefs are in trouble around the world. There's absolutely no question of that. This is a map showing uh, the, the, uh, the levels of threat facing reefs today, the changes between 1998 and 2007. The ones in red are areas where there's been an increase in the threats to the reef. The uh, blue areas are still somewhat stable. I, I would say that the fact that most of the Great Barrier Reef there is blue is probably um, over, a little overconfidence on the part of the map makers. Um, because in, in the Great Barrier Reef, you, of course, have some particular problems, one of which is this, the crown of thorns starfish, which uh, sometimes seems to appear in huge numbers, we're not really too sure why, and eats the coral, the coral polyps. So it, it, uh, it's become a major problem since, since the mid-60s. Uh, I think some sort of environmental change, something maybe we did to the reef or happened naturally, suddenly caused a huge influx in these crown of storm starfish which destroyed great areas of the Great Barrier Reef and a lot of money has been spent trying to control them. Um, possibly rising temperatures in the seas they think may promote the greater development of young starfish and that may be one of the reasons why there were so many of them all of a sudden from the mid 60s on. Uh, now uh, one of the big problems that we find the result of pollution and also somewhat warming temperatures is the seas are becoming more acid and remember that's a problem because remember coral reefs require the right balance of acidity to make their stony skeletons they can't, if it gets too acid, the calcium carbonate dissolves. They can't build a stony skeleton. So where acidity is going up, that's a real problem for the continued growth of the reef. And you can see here that they're, they're showing variations where it, there's, there's a higher acidity content, uh, mostly again in colder waters, but it's encroaching uh, warmer areas such as the ones we're passing through right now around Cape York and uh, up around uh, the Gulf of Carpentaria. Uh, temperature and pollution together have caused this problem, you've probably all read about it, called coral bleaching, where an entire coral reef section seems to die. It's all the polyps are dying, the reef seems to turn white. And again, you can see the levels of alert building up in different parts of the world. Uh, this is as of 2019. This was put together by the National Oceanic and, Air and Aeronautic Administration of the United States to show where the problems are. Now, what happens, what is, cor what is coral bleaching? Well, this is where we come to this point I made earlier, that the reason coral polyps have colors is because of these algae living in their tissues. Well, what happens when coral bleaches is that the coral gets stressed by rising temperatures or by the presence of silt or pollutants, and they simply vent all these algae out into the ocean. They simply discharge them from their tissues, and uh, the algae leave the coral. The coral is left without them, it's so the color is gone from the coral, and what is more, the coral's source of food is also gone. So the coral polyps die and wither away, and you're left with just the white skeletons of the coral. So it's the loss of those algae that is what makes coral bleaching happen. And this is the result you get. Unfortunately, is a dying reef, and this is happening. They, there is, uh, they can recover to some degree, and there people are working on different ways to try and increase the recovery rate. But when you get something like this, you have an extremely depauperate ecosystem, degraded and and basically ruined for a long time. Uh, and that's not just a matter for people like me who are conservationists and environmentalists and greenies or whatever you want to call us and care about such things. This is economically very, very important. Reefs are tremendously valuable. Uh, they provide so much for people. Uh, they provide, of course, fisheries, commercially valuable fisheries, very important in many reef parts of the world. Uh, there are medicines that have been developed from the algae and the corals living on the reef that have been quite important, uh, antivirals, even there's an anti-cancer drug that was developed uh, from studies of coral reefs. Uh, of course, tourism, 
Uh, people don't want to come and see dead reefs, they want to come and see live reefs. And so your tourism dollar going into places like the Great Barrier Reef is going to be greatly increased if the reefs are healthy. Um, the reefs provide protection from storms. Dead coral disintegrates quickly. Nothing's building it back up again. So protecting uh, a shoreline from cyclone damage, you need a healthy living reef. Um, and people depend on it. 500 million people around the world rely on reefs for their food. They rely on it to protect their coasts. They rely on it for their livelihoods, whether it's fishermen or tourist guides or, or whatever you want to call them. And uh, the United States uh, uh, has de determined, the Fisheries Department, that just in the U.S. alone, and uh, that's mostly out in the Pacific, of course, reefs are worth 100 million, more than $100 million a year. This is crucial. This is important. Protecting reefs needs to be done. The estimated net worth worldwide, t almost $30 billion a year generated by coral reefs into the world economy. So this is, this is a concern for everybody, and I'm hoping that includes everyone here. And that concludes my lecture, and thank you very much for listening.